picking up with Kate and the family, getting to the payphone. In the previous minute, they've yanked it out of some poor French woman's hands. And now Kate's collecting her thoughts, cue being the game plan to get Kevin, get in contact with him at least. Kind of dishes out some instructions to the family. And then we cut back to Kevin, who we last saw hiding under the bed. And here he gives himself a little pep talk, convinces himself that he's the man of the house. Uh, He (laughs) emerges from underneath the bed, comes outside, declares to no one in particular that he's not afraid anymore. But then who should appear but the South Bend shovel slayer himself, old man Marley. Scares Kevin, get a good classic Colkin scream out of him, and he begins to run back inside. A very good scream, in fact. Um, I know this is a bit out of order, but because you said to no one in particular, I do want to zoom in on that. Is he saying I'm not afraid anymore to no one in particular, or is he saying I'm not afraid anymore to the shadowy figures he saw in the window? It does seem like he is addressing the wet bandits, but they're not there anymore. And we're back to our classic debate over what do we call speech? That is addressing someone who the character believes to be there, but is not there. Right. Because we're, we're transitioning out of the, like the scene just before being soliloquy, right? Yes. Yes. I'm the man of the house. That's a textbook soliloquy. Yeah. So I'm going to say it's, it's dialogue directed toward the wet bandits, but falls in the ears of old man Marley, who's like... What are you not <laughs> afraid of? And if it's me, well, you should be. Because look at me. I'm going to stare menacingly at you silently. A hello could go a long way here. Like, Can you imagine if he just said, yo. A wave? How are you? It's not like Kevin doesn't give him a chance. John Williams has to fill this lull in the conversation between the two with some very haunting music. I'm going to go ahead and break our cardinal rule really early and go further ahead in the film and say he should take his own advice. (laughs) You can say hello. (laughs) You don't just have to stand there with a frown on your face. That's TikTok video worthy. Is that how we promote this episode is a clip of him going... You don't have to be afraid. You can say hello. (laughs) Right. Scary, ominous, gloomy old man Marley not saying hello to the young boy. I don't know. Marley is dressed well here. He's dressed like a, one might say he's shovel slaying. (laughs) He's got his hair combed real nice. He's got that nice winter coat. He's got a nice... Uh, like a flannel shirt underneath. He gets dressed up to shovel the sidewalk. Well, I think he just gets dressed up to go about his day, which I've found to be true of most elderly people. Yeah. And then at night, he goes out and shovels the sidewalk with how he was done up from, I don't know, 4.30 that morning. (laughs) 5.30 a.m. Time to put on my slacks. It just... Stand around all day. Just moping around about my son. Read the paper. Maybe go to the post office with a t- if I can find my tie. <laughs> That's true. We've devolved in our fashion standards quite a bit. Is it linear or do you think there will be a pendulum swing? I don't think it's linear. I think it's more of a Meganer or a Jeffer or a buzzer. At the buzzer. Boom shakalaka. Speaking of that crew Mm -hmm. we start with them we start this minute with them we do yes we start them so i like that you call her the qb because she's absolutely settling into this great delegation cadence yes and everybody's on board right she's like and i think because she's leading from the front yes yes that is a big part of leadership she's not just bossing people around she's saying and even explaining as much i'm gonna call the police peter book us of light home and he's just like he he doesn't even say anything he just 
He gets, yeah. He's like, yep, got it. Steps into gear. And I like the natural bit of her trying to get change out of her purse for Lenny to call everybody that she knows. And while also doing this like, oh, I'm seeing my address book. Yes, it's a, like a spontaneous idea that hits her. Yeah, it's great acting or improv. I'm not entirely sure how that was. It's not the script. <sighs> it's so good. Oh, it actually, it actually is. Hold on. I don't. Yes, never mind. It is in the script that she gives the address book to Leslie and says, call everyone on our street. So I'll still give her credit for that, though, because her handing her the book as just Lenny, here's some change. Leslie, here's the book. That is, it sounds like what it is in the script, but her making it a very natural one to the other and like her having that realization in the moment, just great work all around. Agreed. I have one question about the address book. I'm ready. Is it more likely that it's sorted by name or by street? It's got to be sorted by name. You know, like 99% of address books. Because the direction that she gives to mm -hmm. Leslie is to call everyone on our street. Yes. It's not a spreadsheet where she can sort by street name. So Leslie, who I assume, even though she is more gregarious than Frank, she's probably not gone up and down the street and met all the neighbors and would be like, Okay, so you've got, uh, <coughs> sorry. Okay, so you've got the Murphys. I should probably give them a call. Let me look them up. How small is too small to call plot hole? I don't think this is a plot hole at all. I What I envision Leslie doing is going through the address book page by page and looking for anyone who lives on Lincoln. That seems time consuming but if you're just looking for that one keyword and you're just dragging your finger down each page really quickly you're gonna find the five or six people that kate has in her address book that live that is a thick address book yes but in a family emergency as in all aspects of life you help in the way you're being asked to help just to argue against myself a little bit here, here's how Frank could be useful. If Leslie goes to page one, page two, page three, finds the first one, while she's making that call, he could then be looking Find for the next, the next one. instance. Yes. Frank does make a funny face when they get this He, he looks put task. off. Yeah. <laughs> he does. But yes, they could absolutely tag team this pretty well. Um, one thing I hadn't noticed before was Tracy. She's just kind of standing there in a weird way. <laughs> so Leslie, in order to grab the address book, hands her gloves. And Tracy, looking a bit like Frank, is put off by this. And then after Leslie receives the book, hands the gloves back. <laughs> as if saying, as if to say... I'm not holding these gloves. There are way too many people in this shot. When it cuts from Kate to the family and Brooks there, Leslie and Uncle Frank are there. There's too many people in the background. It's the frame is filled with all sorts of people who had to come up with tasks to look like it's a bustling airport. From a blocking perspective, it looks like what I used to call a theater shot, but I now call a Netflix shot because you'll notice all these very weird bits of blocking where everyone's facing in the same direction, like two camera. <laughs> yeah. Movie which, poster blocking. Yeah. Like, because in the old days of cinema, you know, people were just adapting theater. So it just looked like something from stage. But all those really bad Netflix series do that now, among many other things. I was at a, a school play that a friend was at one time and the ensemble cast was trying to make it look like a busy train depot or something like that. And my friend and another actor had developed this loop 
of action in the background where one would walk towards the center stage and put his briefcase down like a spy and the other one would <laughs> come from the other direction and pick it up and walk the other way. And then they would repeat that like as a loop over and over. The scene went on forever. They kept doing it and it started to look like a Hanna-Barbera cartoon. <laughs> kind of like that, uh, kind of like Green Day's music video for Redundant. I don't think I know that one. Ooh, there's some homework for you. Okay. And the listening audience. There we go. Green Day, whom by the time this episode is out, you and I will have seen perform live at a baseball stadium. Right. Like right now, it sounds as good as it's going to sound because it's in our minds. And by the time you hear this, we will have heard it in an open air baseball stadium. And we will have decided whether we had a fun time or not. Oh, I'm deciding now. I'm excited. We're having a blast. We have to speak in the past tense. We had a blast. It was so much fun just to hang out with you and our bros. By bros, I mean your wife. (laughs) My closest bro. Those are some strange wedding vows, by the way. You said bro a lot. To the bro I share everything with. (laughs) Can't wait to bro out with you like forever. The first time I saw you, I knew we'd be bros. (laughs) You had me at bro. You may now fist bump your wife. (laughs) Yeah, the last time you saw Green Day, was it at a baseball stadium? No, but it was outdoors. Okay. So was that a pretty big arena? Uh, It was at a festival, actually. Gotcha. Okay. So the last time different setup because everyone's on ground level. Yeah, we have some seats. We get to sit down and enjoy the show. Kind of looking forward to that. Perks of being an aging emo. I just looked it up the last time I saw Green Day. It was in a venue that holds 1,200 people. Was it Gilman? No. (laughs) Yeah, I saw him. I haven't seen him since Kerplunk. (laughs) I wonder if they've put out anything since then. (laughs) You're just... (laughs) You're just scrolling through their Spotify catalog be like, is this the same one? <laughs> I, I don't even see the songs I know. <laughs> yeah, that's probably a experience that you and I share where you open up a band on Spotify and you scroll down to their albums, but the albums you want to listen to, you have to hit the yep. C <laughs> discography button. <laughs> Because they put out so many albums since then, and you, I'll use my I statement. I don't care. I want the one that came out when I was in eighth grade, please. It is, it is a common occurrence. Yeah, you go to, you go to their page, and it's not under popular, right? It's not the popular songs or the releases. So you go deep, and honestly, the the this is uh, those are weird. Yeah, those are. Very difficult to predict. I'm not entirely sure what the best I can say for them is that they seem to, in the case of, let's say, legacy artists, they seem to essentially have all of the hits top to bottom. But if that person has released or if that artist has released something recently, single wise, it will be at the top of that list. Yes. But then it goes straight into the, okay, you tried that. Here's the encore set list yeah i like a curveball every now and then here's all the a sides here's here's a slightly deeper cut if you want to check it out maybe you like that one probably what the algorithm supports is that no no we do not like the deeper cuts so what is buzz doing in this scene because we don't really see him has he already started fixing his hair because we'll see him doing that in a in a few minutes Right, he's doing that in the, what is that, Rob's house? No, he's at the airport later on when uh, Kate's getting the, the one flight home. Buzz is standing there in the back, still fixing his hair, which I get. He got French babes everywhere. <laughs> but he is strangely absent from what you aptly called the ensemble shot. Yeah. Because we get, we get Megan and Lenny doing their bit of bits that they're involved with in this scene and we get fuller just yeah they're flanking the mom and, and fuller out front and he you know twin linked 
to Brooke and back, like to the the larger crowd, and they yeah seem to all be present. Peter, for Wesley, Buzz. Frank, Sandra, Tracy, Jeff, Rod, Heather's there. Like I, I really think it's just Buzz that we're missing. He's fixing his hair. Just had a long flight. You never know. Now here's here's another uh, Home Alone cinematic universe movie. The few minutes that Buzz was missing and no one cared. Buzz Buzz alone in the Paris airport. I think he's in the bathroom. Gotta be. Long flight. Time zones have got him all messed up with his digestive tract. He ate everything on that flight. (laughs) I can't see him as being very hungry and insisting that he go get a beignet. Well, he's like one unsupervised, right? All the parents are front, so he's extra buzz. And he's around family and cousins and things, so he's like showing off. So he's like, you know, elbowing Rod and being like, hey, if you ask him for three desserts, they have to give it to you. And just saying <laughs> all those things that kids make up, but yeah. end up being kind of true. I like the idea of the whole family in a rush to get off this plane. Probably the flight attendants have made special arrangements to have their carry on bags and things already there. And they're at the front of the plane waiting for it to open. And he's like, dad, give me some money. I need a croissant. I'm starving. (laughs) And Peter goes, not, not now, Buzz. And he just insists that he doubles down until Peter gets his wallet out. Maybe Frank gives him a traveler's check. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to be honest. I don't recall seeing him in the running earlier. Not that we really saw much of everybody in that anyway, but. Yeah, it's hard to get the whole gang, but yeah, I don't remember seeing him either. Yeah, he, he hopped out. He's taking his time getting off the plane. He's finding the closest baguette store. He's just, he's just starving. Conspiracy theory. <clears throat> the reason they have everyone with stage blocking and compressed into the shot is because he's actually not on set this day. Oh, that's very possible. Yeah. For whatever reason. They want the shot to seem so full that you can feasibly be missing some people. Well, if they wanted and the it, best way to do that is just have them shoulder by shoulder. Yeah. And strangers in the background sort of milling about unnecessarily. My last question to you on this half of the minute or this 30 seconds is something I've not Googled the answer for, so I don't actually know. But do you know how to say she'll have to call you back in French? <laughs> no. It's a funny line. It's very funny. I, I love that slow recognition that after Q being the whole plan, she remembers that she has a live call <laughs> on the receiver. Well, we notice the lady walk away. Mm-hmm. Like she doesn't go to another phone. So I wonder if it was in the wrap up phase of the call. I think Blue Dress Lady was about to get on a plane to somewhere else. And her partner, her romantic partner, didn't want her to go. She was calling and having one last conversation. And her partner had her almost convinced to just turn around, come back to our Paris home and patch things up. What do you say? And then you hear a bunch of English commotion, a little bit of a hubbub. And then some American lady say, what? What? (laughs) She'll call you back. (laughs) Click. Saying hello four times. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. So does that in turn force him to run to the airport to get her? No, this is a this is a lost love. Blue dress takes it as a sign and gets on the plane. Oh B D. Where is she now? Good question. Could we look up and find out? Pretty easily. Will we do it? Might as well. I don't think she's French. Ooh, I think she's, I think she knows French at least. When I went to imdb.com, the front page advertisement was for Emily in Paris. Is that her name? Emily? Yeah. It's like the people who uh, lisp when they say Barcelona. <laughs> yes. Woman in airport. No, no, that's the, the old lady. French woman. It's gotta be French woman, right? Assuming they're not talking about the French gate agent. Uh, Lynn Mansbach, known for Home Alone and the 1993 TV series Missing Persons. 
one episode. I do see some French language stuff when I Google her. So I think she is actually French. I need proof. Whoa, weird. Is this the same lady? I'm looking on x.com, formerly Twitter, and she seems to have been a member back in 2011. She retweeted five WWE posts and then never tweeted again. I'm going to say no. That's probably just a common surname. You think so? The profile picture does look younger than what I would expect. Wait, you said Lynn? Lynn, L-Y-N-N. That's the French gate agent. Oh. Or is it? No, 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 no. Right, because, yeah, you're right, because the gate agent's Hope Davis. Prettiest person in the movie. Easy. She's aged pretty well. Okay, well, my my searches have come to a close. Then, yeah, let's round this out. Let's just say it's, uh, we don't know, but we... (laughs) What were we trying to find out again? If she's French. If she's French, I did see some, I saw some evidence that pointed to that. There were some French language websites that had her name listed as an an actress. So my assumption is is she actually is French. She sounds French. She's speaking French. I would like for someone to translate what she's saying. Okay. Listeners. French listeners. Maybe she's Canadian. (laughs) Yes, that's French she's speaking. But no, she's not French. She's Canadian. Hotly anticipated episodes. So the second half of this minute, Mm -hmm. the second 30 seconds of the 32nd minute, are Kevin-centric. At some point, Kevin has not only hidden under the bed, he's entombed himself with some Christmas gift bags. Red, of course. One with a kitty cat on it. Yep. You gotta have the variety. You gotta have that like solid color red and then one that's got a cat on it for some reason. Is a cat, where does a cat rank in Christmas animals? It's a Halloween animal, so pretty like, low. Reindeer is number one. <laughs> okay. And then if you're in New Orleans, alligator. <laughs> what? Christmas gator? You've never heard the night before Christmas Cajun Cajun version? style? Yeah. The, the Nolans version? Yeah. So reindeer, number one. Gators, number two. <laughs> That's a reach. But I don't know what would be. I think everything else is a distant second. This is a good family feud question where everyone knows the first answer. And then it's just X. Partridge. Okay, sure. Turtle dove. So all of the... All the 12 Days of Christmas animals. Because we even see Turtle Dove appearing in our next season. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. We'll see in two years, guys. (laughs) Someone note this. Um, French hens. Mm Mm-hmm. Swans. Pipers. All seem more Christmassy than a cat. Halloween aside, like Halloween notwithstanding. Yeah, cat, cat is still not a Christmassy animal. Polar bear? Yes, now we're talking. Reindeer, polar bear. Maybe we're looking at this all wrong. Maybe that's the signal we're getting because they've already taken all the gifts with them. So they have gifts they've taken to Paris. They have gifts that are set under the tree. We Assumedly, the bags that he's using to entomb himself are the leftovers. So maybe this is actually a commentary on how bad a cat bag is for Christmas. To be left sitting around in mom and dad's bedroom at this point of the holiday season. Yeah, makes sense. You are the bag that guards a wimp. (laughs) He can't be a wimp. He's the man of the house. We are missing some time, albeit a small amount. I was going to ask you that. How much... How much time do you think has elapsed between when we last saw Kevin sort of panting in fear and then moving the gift bags aside and coming to this realization that he can't be a coward in this moment? I just think it's a couple of minutes. It's probably pretty close to real time as we're watching the film. Okay. Of that quick of a turnaround? Maybe twice the amount, but I don't think much more. Similarly, we lose a bit of time between him getting out from under the bed and walking out the front door. I do like that. I appreciate it. The 
student film version of this has him getting all out the room, down the hallway, down the stairs, to the front door. They set up and shoot all of those shots. My student film has him sledding down the stairs. <laughs> He's used to it now. That's just how he goes downstairs now. Yeah, yeah. It's really innovated. He uses one of those electric stair chairs for the elderly to bring it back. Mm -hmm. Like a ski lift. Mm -hmm. And he's smart enough to do it right after coming down. He doesn't leave the sled in the front yard and then remember and have to go out for it. Like Kevin's the kind of kid who flies out the door and picks up the sled, gets it back up the stairs for next time, and then goes about his day. It's practical like that. He's a bit more conscientious than most. I like how old man Marley's shadow enters on him. And it doesn't quite make sense physics-wise because he kind of comes in from the side. Like It doesn't quite make sense with the reverse shot. But I still like it, that shadow coming in on Kevin as he's trying to put a brave face on here. It's really great. It's a cartoonish quality that's executed in a very real way that doesn't take you out of the film at all. I'm going to give some credit to John Williams. He once again is able to compose very ominous Christmas music here. Minor key bells. That's the secret. When is the Home Alone's minor key bell song happening? Sooner than it would have otherwise. That's why we do the podcast. That's right. Inspiration. As long as we're doling credit out, I would like to give some credit to props slash, what is the word? I can't believe I'm like, I'm blanking on this word. Continuity. Mm. Yes. So I'd like to dole out some credit for props and continuity, because if you look, they still have a ribbon missing from the lamppost. Oh. The one that was torn off in the yeah, earlier geez. gust. Juicy detail. I like it. Yeah, you, you, because it's it's such a symmetrical shot with mm -hmm. Kevin coming out. Yeah. You can distinctly see one there and one that's not, and I really appreciate that. Man, these guys are paying attention. So props to props, props to continuity. As usual. If you hear the scream <laughs> that Kevin expels here and you're old man Marley, how do you respond to that? I'll just see him at church.